Thank you very much. Uh, I feel like a little in, a bit of an interloper here because I'm not an economist, but when I was invited, I realized that maybe that was a good thing, at least for this panel. Uh, I, my work is in political science, and I've been interested in, for many years in how societies adapt to and innovate in the face of very complex challenges. And I found over the last 15 years that uh, that uh, the body of work that could be loosely called complexity theory is enormously useful to my thinking about these issues. And certainly one component of that body of work that is clearly enormously important now in our world is what we could call complexity economics. Uh, in my conversations with folks such as those on the, on the, uh, the stage here and others, who are interested in complexity economics, I've identified three areas that seem to be, or three themes that seem to be very prominent in terms of defining a future research program in complexity economics, and these are the three here. Uh, an interest in how to understand and respond to crisis, a deeper understanding of innovation, and a much richer understanding of sustainability, what you might call deep green ecological economics, all of which can be uh, very much informed by complexity economics. Just say a few words on each of these very quickly because uh, there's a little time left this morning. Uh, but there's some very interesting developments within other regions of complex systems theory, for instance, within ecology and physics, uh, looking at how systems flip uh, from one state to another, uh, shift from one equilibrium to another, dynamic in time, as our speakers have talked about uh, this morning. And, uh, uh, and this work holds out the promise of potentially developing advanced indicators of those flips. Uh, for instance, ecologists now can, uh, can determine in advance with some precision, the probability of a lake flipping from a clear to a turbid state because of increasing nutrients in the lake. And some of the statistical indicators that, uh, that they use are potentially applicable within climate systems and also within economies. And that could be, of course, enorm of enormous policy use. Uh, um, Ian has already spoken about the importance of resilience and highly connected, complex systems. Uh, I think this means that we have to get beyond things like capital adequacy ratios and, and uh, think about uh, a range of other things and other policy tools that, that may not have been on our radar screen at all that might help us increase resilience, including perhaps various forms of uh, disaggregation of the economy and loosening of coupling in the economy to prevent cascading failures. With respect to innovation, uh, I think that it's fair to say that conventional neoclassical economics has a rather impoverished theory of how innovation occurs. And I think there's an enormous possibility within complexity theory for pushing that, uh, expanding that understanding of innovation. And, and uh, Brian Arthur has made major progress, I think, in helping us understand the implications of, uh, of in particular, a combination of novel elements that already exist in the known world, these can be concepts, technologies, institutional forms, uh, into new combinations along the boundary of what Stuart Kaufman has very helpfully called the adjacent possible, which is at the boundary between the known and the unknown. And, uh, and it's this combination process, which we've learned from, for instance, evolutionary theory, that is in many cases the source, the fundamental source of innovation in all kinds of complex systems. And we can, I think, derive a much better understanding of that combination process through complex systems theory. As you cross the boundary of the adjacent unknown and colonize a new area of technologies and concepts and institutional forms, uh, you then open up new possibilities and in a sense push back that, that adjacent possible uh, boundary and as you progress into that territory, you're really becoming uh, structurally path dependent. You, you are in a, in a zone uh, that uh, is where, as Brian has said, history is very important. How you got there really matters. And a critical idea here is that there is, as Brian has suggested, a co-evolution between agents and structures. Uh, agents are creating the structures the markets, the institutions, the technologies to which they're responding to, and, 
and then in turn responding to the new structures. And the agents evolve themselves over time. Uh, and notice the importance of time through all of this kind of conversation. And finally, sustainability is, uh, is obviously an issue of great concern. We'll be hearing more about that this afternoon. And within a complex systems perspective or complexity economics perspective, the economy is seen as part of a larger ecological and biophysical system that encompasses the planet. In particular, the economy is seen as necessarily having, having to be constrained by things like the laws of thermodynamics, that the economy depends on enormous inputs of high quality energy and, uh, and throws enormous quantities of entropy in the form of waste into the external environment. And any economic theory or economic system that uh, proposes to violate the laws of thermodynamics is uh, misguided at best and just nonsense at worst. And complexity-based ecological economics will uh, challenge in some fundamental respects uh, deep assumptions that are common to uh, conventional economics, such as one that, uh, that is a particular uh, concern to me is the assumption of infinite substitutabil substitutability between natural and human capital. Uh, and, and, and I think that challenge could be a, a rich and productive challenge in a way that wouldn't, it simply isn't possible within conventional economics. At the intersection of these three themes uh, that I'm suggesting here, uh, we need a set of methods allowing us to explore these research topics. And uh, uh, very quickly, I'll just show you what some of these methods might look like. Brian and Ian and others have already mentioned them uh, in passing system dynamics, nonlinear dynamic models uh, that uh, build in inherently feedback loops, especially positive feedback loops that allow for nonlinear change in systems over time so that we can identify critical thresholds and path dependence in systems. Uh, Agent-based computational labs, I think this is a very interesting idea uh, that, that Brian has suggested to, uh, to folks in the past, that you know, an engineer or a set of engineers designing an airplane can take their, their design and test it in a wind tunnel, but economists and policymakers don't have an equivalent test bed. It's conceivable that within complexity economics and a research program in complexity economics, we could develop an essentially an institutional test bed in which we could stress test institutional designs, especially within agent-based models where we program the agents to, to evolve over time in response to a new institution or policy that we're suggesting and see how it can be gamed and how uh, you can experience various forms of regulatory arbitrage and, uh, and understand the potential positive and negative unexpected consequences as the system evolves over time in a way that is simply impossible right now. And then finally, uh, since we are definitively out of time, the, uh, uh, there is really quite extraordinary opportunity now to, uh, uh, to exploit the kind of large-scale, multi-person uh, online environments for carrying out re real economic experiments. If you look at, uh, for instance, Second Life, which has millions of people involved, the real economy has developed within Second Life, and it allows for the possibility of actually understanding these, these economies, the principles of these economies, and testing out some, uh, some possibilities. Uh, uh, that and hypotheses derived from complexity economics. Uh, and it's conceivable that we could, for the first time in economics, engage in very large scale uh, computer based uh, experiments uh, without all the kinds of ethical considerations that have constrained experimentation in the past. And uh, with that, I'll just put up a uh, final slide, some possible research topics that we're considering of undertaking at the University of Waterloo, just to give this a little bit more of a concrete character. Thank you very much.